to Grafton X, chapter one. Chapter one, Santa Teresa, California, Monday, March 6, 1989. The state at large and the town of Santa Teresa in particular were nearing the midpoint of a drought that had slithered into view in 1986 and wouldn't slither off again until March of 1991 when the miracle rains arrived. Not that we dared anticipate relief at the time. From our perspective, the pitiless conditions were upon us with no end in sight. Local reservoirs had shrunk, leaving a wide swath of dried mud as cracked as an alligator's hide. My professional life was in the same state, always worrisome when you are the sole your own sole financial support. Self-employed is a mixed bag. The upside is freedom. Go to work when you like, come home when you like, and wear anything you please. While well, you still have bills to pay though, and you can accept a new job offer or decline. It's all up to you. The downside is the uncertainty and the feast or famine mentality that not everyone can tolerate. My name is Kinsey Milhoney. I'm a private det detective by trade doing business as Milhoney Investigations. I'm a female, 38, 38 years old, twice divorced and childless, a status I maintain with rigorous attention to my birth control pills. Despite the shortage of new clients, I had a shitload of money in the bank <laughs> so I could afford to sit tight. Um, my savings account had been plumped up by an unexpected sum that dropped into my lap um, six months before, I'd invested the major chunk of it into mutual funds. The remaining cash I kept in a money market account that I designated untouchable. Friends, on hearing about my windfall, received me as certifiable. Forget about work. Why not travel and enjoy life? I didn't give the question credits. At my age, retirement is not, a, not out of the question, and even temporary idleness could have driven me insane. True, I could have covered my expenses for months to come with, to um, come up with enough in reserve for a lavish trip abroad, except for the following. One, I'm miserly and cheap. And two, I don't have a passport because I'm, I've never needed one. I had traveled to Mexico some years before, but all that was required in crossing the border there was proof, proof of US citizenship. That aside, anyone who knows me will testify to how ill-suited I am to a life of leisure. When it comes to work, it isn't so much what we do or how much we're paid, it's the satisfaction we take in doing it. In broad terms, my job entails locating witnesses and missing persons, following paper trails, um, through the halls of records, sitting surveillance on insurance scammers, and sometimes tailing the errant spouse. My prime talent is snooping, which I love to do which sometimes includes a touch of breaking and entering. This is entirely naughty of me, and I'm ashamed to um, confide how much fun it can be, but only if I don't get caught. This is the truth about me, and you might as well know it. I'm passionate about a lot of things. I'm passionate about <clears throat> um, all manners of criminals, killers, thieves, and uh, ne'er-do-wells, the pursuit of whom I find engaging and entertaining. Life cheaters are everywhere, and my mission is to eradicate, eradicate the lot of them. I know this speaks volumes about the paucity of my personal life, but that's my nature in a nutshell. My quest for law and order began in the first grade when I ventured into the cloakroom and surprised a classmate snitching a chocolate bar from my howdy duty lunchbox. The teacher appeared at that very moment and caught the child with my candy in hand. I, I anticipated due process, but the sniveling, sniveling little shit burst into tears, claiming I'd stolen it from her. Ugh, my teacher turned a deaf ear to over oh, my house of protest. From that singular event, my notion of fair play was set. And in sum, it is this. The righteous are struck down by the sticky fingered escape. I've labored all I've labored all my life to see that justice plays out the other way around. That particular Monday morning, I was paying my bills. And I was feeling so virtuous. So why would I not feel virtuous? I'd written and signed all the pertinent checks and felt only slightly anxious about the drain on my funds. I'd addressed and sealed the return envelopes. As I licked and placed stamps, I was, I was humming with satisfaction and really looking forward to lunch. Um, when the phone rang, I lifted the handset, handset and anchored it against my shoulder saying, Mahoney Investigations. 
Hi, Kenzie, this is Ruthie. Did I catch you at an okay time? Sure, what's going on? Well, I'm fit to be tied. I swear, about the time I think I'm through the worst of it, something else comes up. Today, I got this official looking letter from the IRS. Pete's being audited, of all things. I'm supposed to call to set up an appointment. Well, can't you tell them that he's dead? I could, but that's probably what triggered the audit in the first place. Ruthie Walensky had been widowed some seven months before, in August of 1988, when her husband was shot to death in what looked like a robbery gone wrong. I'd made Pete Walensky's acquaintance 10 years prior. Like me, he was a private detective, which worked for, uh, he would work for an agency called Bergshine Investigations. I'd apprentice, I'd apprentice with Ben Bird and Morley Shine when I was racking up the hours I needed for licensing. Pete was a contemporary of theirs. Both of my bosses um, swore he was a top-notch detective, but at this point, when our paths intersected, he had fallen onto hard times. By then, he was a man uh, so morally bent, I marveled he managed to find work anywhere. While I disliked him, I was there tw I was then 27 years old and newly employed and didn't feel like it was my place to make my thoughts known. Besides which, no one asked and I doubt they'd have listened if I volunteered my views. I thought the world of, two, of the two seasoned detectives and I still conducted business in the time-honored ways that they taught me. Unfortunately, Ben and Morley had quarreled bitterly and their partnership had been dissolved. They went their separate ways setting up independent agencies. I was already out on my own by then and never heard the details of their falling out. Whatever the dispute, it had nothing to do with me, so I shrugged it off. Now, both were dead, and I assumed the past was dead and buried along with them. As for Ruthie, over the years, I'd seen her from time to time, but we didn't become friends until shortly after Pete was killed. I pondered the historical content while she went on to describe the latest crisis, saying, sorry to bother you with this, but let me read you what it says. They're asking for Schedule C gross receipts, year-end papers and reports including worksheets, recon reconciling books, and records for the tax years 1986 and 1997. She continued on a sing-song voice. In addition, please provide any and all business records, files, expenses, and receipts for the period of 1975 through 1978. Are you kidding me? That goes back 15 years. I thought after seven you could throw all that crap out. I guess not, at least according to this. Our accountant retired last year, and I'm having a devil of a time getting through to the fellow who took over for him. I was hoping when you and Dietz went through Pete's um, boxes, you might have come across some of our old tax returns. Robert Dietz was the Nevada private and guest investigator whose help I'd enlisted during the period just after Pete was killed. Much more of the story, of course, but I made a point of putting it out of my mind. I don't think so. I can't swear to it, but the whole point was tracking down his accounts. So anything with a dollar sign attached to it, we shoved into plastic bags, which we handed over to you. Too bad, she said. I've searched those bags twice and there's nothing in there. Zilch. You want me to try again? It's always possible we missed a box. That's it. I don't have them. All those cartons are gone. Where? The dump. A junk dealer, t um... Taped a flyer to my door. He must have been cruising the area looking for work. The notice said for 50 bucks in cash, he'd clean out my garage and haul the mess away. I jumped at the chance. I've wanted to park my car undercover for years, but there was never any room. Now I'm looking at an audit and what am I supposed to do? I'm just sick about all this. Hmm, I don't know what to suggest. I can double check, but if we crumb across tax returns, we'd have set them aside. I did keep one box, but those are confidential files, files from the old bird shine days. I have no idea how they ended up in Pete's hands. Oh, wait a minute. The IRS does list bird shine in the document request now that you mention it. Hold on. I heard papers rattling and then she said, I can't find the reference now, but it's in here somewhere. You don't need to bother Dietz, but would you check the box you have? I don't need much. I'm guessing a few old statements could suffice. If I, can, if I can hand over anything, it'll be a good show of faith, which is all I have to offer right now. Oh, sure, I'll inventory the contents as soon as possible. No big hurry. I'm driving up to Lompoc this, uh, this coming weekend to celebrate my birthday with a friend. Oh, I didn't know it was your birthday. Happy birthday. Oh, thanks. We're not doing much, just hanging out. But I haven't seen her since Pete died, and I thought it'd be nice to, um, to get away. 
absolutely. When do you get back? Sunday afternoon. What gives you some wriggle room? Even if I did call the IRS today, I doubt I'd get in right away. They must have a waiting list a mile long, she said. Oh, and while you're at it, keep this in mind. Pete had a habit of um, tucking stray documents between the pages of other files. Sometimes he'd hide money too, so don't toss out any $100 bills. I remember the wad of cash he buried in the bag of birdseed, I said. That was something, wasn't it? He claimed the system was designed to um, fool the bad guys. He could remember where he'd put all the bits and pieces, but he, could, but he wouldn't explain his strategy. Anyway, I'm sorry to trouble with you with this. I know it's a pain. Oh, no, not a big deal. 15 or 20 minutes tops. I appreciate that. In the meantime, you better talk to a tax expert. Ha, huh, I can't afford one. Better than getting hosed. Good point. My neighbor's an attorney. I'll ask him who he knows. We chatted briefly of other matters and then we hung up. Once again, I found myself brooding about Pete Walensky, which I was um, doing more often than I care to admit. In the wake of his death, it had become clear how irresponsible he'd been, leaving Ruthie with little more than a mess on her hands. His business files, such as they were, had been relegated to countless dusty and dilapidated cardboard boxes stacked 10 deep and eight high in their two-car garage, filling the interior to capacity. In addition, there were piles of unpaid bills. Um, there were threads of lawsuits and no life insurance. Peter carried a policy that would have uh, netted her a handsome, handsome sum, but he'd let the premium lapse. Even so, she adored him, and who was I to judge? To be fair about it, I suppose you could call him a good-hearted good soul, as long as you included an asterisk referring to the small point below. As a perfect example, Peter told Ruthie he was taking her on a cruise on the Danube for their 40th wedding anniversary coming up the following year. He intended to surprise her, but he couldn't help revealing the plan in advance. The real surprise came after his death when she found out he was paying for the trip um, with money he'd extorted in a blackmail scheme. She asked for the deposit back and used the refund to satisfy some of his customers, um, some of his creditors, and that was that. In the meantime, she wasn't hurting for income. Ruthie was a um, private duty nurse and her services were much in demand. From the schedule I'd seen taped to her refrigerator door, she worked numerous shifts and could probably um, name her price regardless of the going rate. As for the banker's box, I put a big black X on the lid, showing it under the, shoving it under the desk in my studio apartment, so the task would have to wait till I got home. I'd been, I'd been meaning to inspect the contacts in any event. If, as I anticipated, the old fire, files were inactive or closed, I'd send them to a shredding company and just be done with it. I'd no more than hung up when the phone rang again. I reached for the handset, saying, Mahoney Investigations. There was a pause. And, the woman, and then a woman said, Hello? I said, Hello? Oh, oh, sorry. Um, I was expecting a machine. May I speak to Miss Mahoney? Her tone was refined, and even through the phone line, I could smell money on her breath. This is she, I said. Oh, my name is Hallie Battencourt. Vera Hess suggested I get in touch with you about a personal matter. Oh, that was nice of her. She had an office next door to mine at California Fidelity Insurance, where I'd worked once upon a time. I said, I take it you're a friend of hers? Well, no. We met at a party a few weeks ago. We were having drinks on the patio. And when I mentioned the issue, she thought maybe you might help. I'll do what I can. Won't you give me your name again? I'm afraid it went right over my head. I could hear the smile in her voice. Bettencourt, she said. First name, Hallie. I do that myself, in one ear and out the other. Amen, I said. Why don't you give me a quick summary of the problem? She hesitated. The situation's awkward, and I'd prefer not to discuss it on the, by phone. I think when I explain, you'll understand. Eh, that's entirely up to you, I said. We can set up an appointment, and you can talk with me about it. What's your schedule look like next week? She laughed uncomfortably. Oh, dear. <laughs> um, That's just it. I'm under a time constraint. I leave town tomorrow evening and won't be back until June. If there's any way we could meet tonight, I'd be grateful. I can probably manage that. Where and what time? Here, at my home at 8 o'clock, if that's all right from you, with you. From what I'm told, it's not a big job. To be honest about it, I contacted another agency last week. 
and they turned me down, which was really embarrassing. The gentleman I spoke with was nice about it, but he made clear the work wouldn't warrant the size of their fees. He didn't come right out and say so, but the impl implication was that they had much bigger fish to fry. I guess I've been gun shy about reaching out again, which is why I put it off. Understood, I said. Hey, look, we'll talk this evening and see where, where we stand. If I can help, I may know someone that will. Thank you. You have no idea how relieved I am. I made a note of the address on Skyview along with her instructions and told her I'd be there around 8 o'clock. I was guessing her problem was matrimonial, which turned out to be true, but not quite as I imagined. Once I hung up, I checked my city map and located the street, which was no bigger than a thread of pale blue surrounded by black space. I folded the map and then I stuck it in my shoulder bag. At 5 o'clock, I locked the office and headed for home, feeling pleased about life. As my appointment wasn't for three hours, I had time for a bite to eat, supping on milk of tomato soup and a gooey grilled cheese sandwich, which I held in a fold of paper towel that really soaked up the excess butter. While I ate, I read three chapters of a Donald Westlake paperback. In hindsight, I marvel at how clueless I was about the shit storm about to come. When I ask myself, what I ask myself even now is whether I should have picked up the truth any faster than I did which was not nearly fast enough. All right, that was chapter one. Thanks for listening.